Can we please have a massive round of applause, please, for Steve Cole? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Straight away, I've broken the rules by standing too much in front of the screen, which casts a little shadow. They don't like that, so I'll try not to do that. But it does sometimes happen. Um, hopefully, um, I'm amplified. I think I've got a little thing in here. Um, and so that'll be all fine. How nice to see you. Thank you for making the effort to come out today. Now, I have written quite a lot of books. Hello. Come on in. That's right. Don't worry about it. The more the merrier. Glad you could make it. Thank you. Um, yes, I have written quite a lot of books. I have written 210 books. I know. I know it's 210 because I counted them all to put off writing the 211th book. <laughs> Uh, which is a, a good little, little trick you can do. Uh, that's over the last 25 years, um, which is pretty much half my life now, because I am, as of September the 11th, I am 51. Um, what a great birthday it is, 9-11. My 30th went really well. That was, yeah, that was, that was, that was not so good. Um, but anyway, because I've been around for a long time, people say to me sometimes, they say, Steve Cole, which is my name, of course. They say, Steve Cole, did you know, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? To which I normally say, no, I had no idea. I had no idea I wanted to be a writer. Um, because, you know, I didn't really think it was something you could do. No one in school was ever saying to me, why not be a writer? You know, it was just something that didn't happen. I knew there were books all around the place because I enjoyed reading them. But it never really sort of like connected with me that I could be one of the people writing those books. But then when I look back on my childhood, I realised that actually, actually I, uh, I, I was obviously clearly always heading that way. Um, right from a very early age. Um, I mean, I brought along a, uh, one of the books that I, uh, that I wrote when I was uh, eight here, eight years old. Um, and it's called The Peter and Anne Adventures. It says on the back, based on the popular TV programme. This is a lie. <laughs> there was no popular TV programme, The Peter and Anne Adventures. But in my mind, there was. Um, this is book two. There were, book, there were five books, actually. Um, and this was, uh, this was quite good for me to write because it wasn't like a, an actual fiction story. It was basically writing a little bit about all the various stories that, uh, that Peter and Anne had on TV. For example, The Shoe. It's a good dramatic title, isn't it? The Shoe. The Shoe lasted two hours, apparently. <laughs> uh, it was all about a very evil lady who lost her foot when she was shot. She did not know, but this shoe had magic powers. It had the power to raise its owner from the dead. Peter and Anne find the shoe, and it brings her back. But she is so old, she dies. <laughs> what kind of a rubbish magic shoe is that? It like, brings you back to life, but it lets like decades go by. And so when you are brought back to life, I live again. Oh, hang on, I'm 103. <laughs> <laughs> rubbish. All right. Anne tries on the shoe, but it is too big, so she discards it. The drama kept coming. Two days later, she is shot in a bank raid. But being the shoe's last owner, the shoe brings her back. Oh, it's straight away. It doesn't wait years and years and years this time. Clearly, the shoe realised early on, hold on, maybe I should have done that a bit sooner, I don't know. They decide to keep the shoe. Well, you would. You know, I'm sure Peter would have rocked it when he wore it. I mean, look, it's a pretty impressive shoe as well. It's, you can see why they kept it. You know, no one's, no one's going to let a shoe of that quality go by. Um, so that was very good. Um, <laughs> there's all sorts of uh, fantastic stories. The head. That was a good one. A woodcutter is having his lunch when he sees a strange object. He looks closer and sees it is a head with a mask. <laughs> a ray shoots from the head's eyes and the woodcutter falls dead. Peter and Anne find the head in a haystack on Rochdale Farm. Anne screams as Peter pulls off the mask. All that remains is an evil light. Dot, dot, dot. And there is a scene of the head killing the woodcutter. You see, this would have been a, a, a very terrifying TV program if you're watching it. Now, obviously, there's, there's lots of these stories. I won't, I won't read all of them to you. But suffice to say, if anyone's sitting in the audience thinking, I would love to be a writer, but I don't think I'm good enough at writing stories. Take a look at the Peter and Anne adventures, and that'll tell you. But what is interesting is that uh, clearly uh, I, I pretended there was a book for each of the Peter and Anne stories, including The Shoe, uh, The Shoe by Stephen Cole, as you see there, because that was the name my mother gave me. Um, I became a Steve later on, but if I hear myself being called Stephen, it's, it's normally my mum telling me off, Stephen! It's that sort of the name, you know. Um, but there is The Shoe by Stephen Cole, only 60p. 
Sadly, if you're expecting one of my books to be 60p these days, you better think again, that's not going to happen. But uh, it goes to show that for every single one of those, I was also writing the book when, and claiming that you know, they were all available in the shop. Basically, I, I was always making stuff up. And I can sort of like trace this back to when, when I was very young. And it all kind of like, it all ties in with, uh, with salad. Salad, yeah. Now, hands up anyone who likes salad in this room. Lots of people like salad. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Um, hands up if you don't really like salad, but you eat it because someone normally is standing over you saying, Eat your salad! Oh, is, that, is that anybody here as well? Yeah, that's, that's some people here as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if you fit into either category, then I am very, I'm very happy for you. I'm very pleased for you. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, I, I have no such luck. I, I have a difficult relationship with salad because uh, it's, it's kind of tricky for me because I can't eat salad without actually physically being sick. It makes, me, it makes me throw up. It's not even like an allergy thing. It's just like, it's, so, it's such an instant reaction. It's literally, you know, I, I can't do it. You know, and I haven't been able to do it ever since I was small. So it's not just I'm, I'm, I'm a fussy eater or anything. And people say, oh, you can't eat salad. I still can't eat it. I'm 51 years old and I can't eat salad. It's kind of like, it really annoys me, you know? And people say, oh, do you not like vegetables? I do, I do, I do like vegetables. I like all sorts of vegetables. It's salad I don't like. This is the trouble. Now it's a trouble because uh, I was brought up in Bedfordshire myself, not in Luton, but just outside Bedford. So, you know, it's kind of you know, homecoming for me here. Um, and in Oakley Lower School in Bedfordshire, um, every Wednesday in the, in the 1970s, every Wednesday was salad day. Now, this was a big problem. Obviously, these days in schools, you get more than just the one choice. You get like, you know, you can have like a cooked meal, you can have like a cold meal, you can have a vegetarian meal. We had none of that in the 1970s. We had none of that. You just had to eat what you were given, and that was it. You, didn't, you had no choice. They were like, and that means every Wednesday, I'd go up to the dinner lady and say, none, please. And she'd say, God, have a little bit, darling. You know, give me this massive bowl of salad. Yeah? Now, because I couldn't, I couldn't eat it, I'd be you know, I'd just, like sat there going, oh, no, I can't eat the salad. My mates would eat their salad. They'd all go outside to play. But the dinner ladies wouldn't let us go out to play until we'd at least made a good job of like, you know, clearing what was on our plate. And I couldn't do that, so I'd be sat there, and there this dinner lady standing over me, and then the bell for the end of lunch would go, so I suppose you better throw it away. And so I'd get up and I'd scrape it in the slot bucket. I'm thinking, it's so unfair, because you know, I haven't had any lunch, I haven't had any playtime, I'm be hungry now, I've got afternoon school, you know, and I've been made to feel like I was doing something wrong. I didn't dare tell my mum and dad, because I thought that you know, they might find out about this, and you know, they'd, they'd, they'd tell me off even more. So I kept quiet about it. I used to really worry on Tuesday nights, oh, Saturday tomorrow, I'm gonna have no lunch, I'm gonna have no playtime, it's not fair, it's not fair. And then one half term, a new dinner lady started. A new dinner lady who didn't know about my hatred of salad, my inability to eat it. And I thought, oh, if I play one sneaky trick, maybe I will get to go out and enjoy my Wednesday lunch break. Do I dare to play that sneaky trick? Yes, I dare. And my sneaky trick was this. I got all the lettuce and then placed it like a protective shield over the rest of the salad, squashing it down. So it looked as if all I had left was the lettuce leaf. And then I tried to sit back with a sort of smile that says, what a delicious, nutritious salad that was. <laughs> What a shame I couldn't quite manage that last leaf of lettuce because everything else, boom, it was so delicious. <laughs> then the uh, new dinner lady came over. Her name was Mrs. Irison, and she was a scary lady. <coughs> she kind of looked like a tank wearing an apron. <laughs> she, was, she was that sort of a, a dinner lady. And she just much walk over to me as sort of like rumble on caterpillar treads. Like, <laughs> so I sat there going, <laughs> Suddenly, I was regretting my life choices considerably. Uh, Mrs. Irison sort of like stirred me. She sort of looked down at the plate. She looked up at me. Down at the plate. She looked up at me. Down at the plate. She looked up at me. She lifted up the lettuce leaf. Yeah. Exposing my salad shame. There it all was. The slice of cucumber. No! A slice of tomato, oh, glutinous oozing seeds, uh, uh, the beetroot, ah, uh, like an internal organ had plopped out onto the plate when no one was looking. The celery, mmm, crunchy wet string, yes please, yeah. The cress, cress, what's the point of cress? Tastes like nothing, gets stuck in your teeth, there's no point to cress. Anyway, very cathartic these events I've had. Anyway, anyway. 
I said, I'm really sorry, I, I, I tried to trick you, miss. It's, it's, because, it's because I can't eat salad. She said, eat it. I said, miss, I can't eat it, I'd be sick. Eat it. If I do that, I'd be sick, though. Eat it. But I'm going to be, eat it. But miss, I, eat it. It just went on, so I couldn't get anything past it. It's like, miss, I, I said, eat it, but I'm, eat it, but eat it. Listen, listen to me. Eat it. In the end, the only way I could convince her that I couldn't eat it was to get the fork, put the fork into the cucumber, put the cucumber into my mouth. I was sick, like I tried to tell her 70 times. Blah! She looked at the mess, she said, OK, don't eat it. <laughs> Great, yeah. Thanks for that, Mrs. Arison. By then, the story had an unhappy ending. There it was all over my plate. I thought, well, at least I might get to go out to play now. No, I'm sending you to the school nurse because you've been sick. But I told you I'd be sick of it. Ah! So I, so I had to go to the school nurse. Now, and this was actually the best thing that could have happened, because when they send you to the school nurse, I don't know if you know this, when they send you to the school nurse, they have to tell the people who look after you. And so my mum was, was, was told, and she came in, and she was quite annoyed that I'd been forced to eat salad. She said, oh, no, Steve can't eat salad. He'd be sick. And Mrs Clark, the head teacher, said, well, yes, we know he'll be sick, but what can we do? We can't not serve salad to the whole school. We can't spoil it for everyone else just because your son can't eat salad. OK? So we arrived at, at a kind of a compromise, you know, a, a, a new way forward. Now, this may not seem like very much to, uh, to you sitting here now, but back in like 1979, this was, this was groundbreaking. I was allowed to take a packed lunch to school. Yeah, I know. First and only person in the school with a packed lunch. And there I sat, people was having their like chicken marango or their liver and bacon and stuff. And I'm sat there, I'm sat there saying, hey, check it out. I got a sandwich, yeah. I was going, whoa, what's going on? I said, yeah, and I got a little bag of crisps here, yeah. Ready salted multi pack, yeah, that's right. And I even got a mini roll, yeah. And the mini roll, well, that was it. They said, whoa, we want some of that sweet lunchbox action that Steve Cole's got going on there. And so, uh, you know, suddenly by the end of that half term, there were two more people sitting on the packed lunch table. By the end of the school year, three tables of us. With school, with school, there's nowhere in evidence. Just the, just the lunch box, the, the packed lunch, it was there. It was like, you know, my salad sick had started this beautiful revolution in the canteen. And people, uh, if they didn't want to, they didn't have to eat those meals. They could actually bring what they wanted to eat for lunch. Sometimes good things do come from these bad situations, you know? You have to sort of ride out the blast and see what happens. But um, I realised, you know, that I was wrong to play that sneaky trick on Mrs Iris. Um, can I ask questions at the, at the end? I will, there will be a Q&A at the end. I realised I was wrong to play that sneaky trick on Mrs Iris. You, know, you know, she was only trying to do her, her job in her own deep-voiced, mean-spirited kind of a way, you know? But what really bugged me was the fact that, you know, when I was found out, I, I, I said sorry and I explained the reason. I, I did what we're meant to do. I sort of told the truth, you know, I sort of like fessed up, I told the truth, you know. And she still didn't believe me. She didn't believe that I'd be sick. It was always eat it, eat it, eat it. And that's what really bugged me. So I thought, she didn't believe the truth, but would she have believed a lie? Oh. Now, I am not saying lie to grown ups. Do not take that away from this lesson. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, Sometimes, if we make things up, we can entertain people, we can distract people, we can do things. I mean, basically, being a writer <laughs> is being a professional liar, OK? Because when I write something like the astrosaurs, about dinosaurs in space, well, guess what? I made that up, OK? I'm sorry to shock you, but, you know, I'm, it, it's, it's, not, it's possibly not true. It might be true. I don't know. I wasn't there 65 million years ago. But it might well not be true. I might have made that up. Um, you know, it's the way it goes. When you're small and you make things up, you get into trouble. When you're large, when you make things up, people give you money, OK? So this is a good thing to think about. And I sort of, like, trace the origins of, uh, of my, my wanting to be a writer to this moment, because I started thinking, what if I could have... Was there anything I could have said that would have made Mrs Irison not make me eat that slice of cucumber, you know? And so I started thinking, you know, what if when she'd been standing over me saying, eat it, what if I'd sort of said to her, no, miss, I'm sorry, but I can't eat it, because I believe that the cucumber was bitten by a vampire. <laughs> she would say, eat it. She said, no, no, miss, miss, no, seriously, it was bitten by the lord of the vampires himself, Count Dracula. It has become Count Dracucumba. <laughs> I'm not eating a slice of Count Dracucumba, all right? That's not going to happen. She would say, eat it. She said, no, I'm not going to eat it. I'm going to defeat it. <laughs> yeah? But then you have to decide, of course, don't you? you have to decide, well, how do you defeat a vampire cucumber? I mean, obviously no such thing as, as vampires, but in the old legends, the old stories, the way to kill a vampire was to hammer a stake through the heart. But a cucumber has no heart, so that's not going to work on Count Dracucumber. 
You can prick him with a cocktail stick all you like. He's never going to hit anything vital, OK? So that's not going to work. If it was a real vampire, well, they hate garlic, don't they? Raw garlic, that's the way to ward off a vampire. Like, oh, nom, nom. <laughs> yeah? That's all like that's meant to get rid of them. But that's not going to work on Count Dracula Cumber either, is it? Because think about it. Cucumbers come out of the ground, garlic comes out of the ground. They're probably related to each other. That's like, you know, if, if, if Dracula came in here, so I started walking towards me, I'd say, get back, Prince of Darkness. I have here your cousin Nathan. <laughs> it's not going to work, is it? Dracula's just going to go, all right, Nate, how's, how's it going? How's, how's the car? You had that car trouble, didn't you? Yeah. Family keeping all right, are they? Yeah. <laughs> no one wants that. So, there's only one way to defeat Count Dracucumber, my friends, and that is with the oldest weapon in the world, the weapon of words. Imagine if the way to defeat Count Dracucumber might have been to perform an anti-vampire cucumber poem. Yeah? And this is a little tip for you, if you're ever trying to think up ideas for stories. Because sometimes, you know, we're asked in class, we're sort of like, we're sort of like you know, saying, you know, I want you to write, you know, make something up about a story. Uh, we want to make something up about a I don't know what to write, I've got no ideas. I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write. Stay calm, chill out, it's fine. Just need to warm up a little bit. Use your imagination, let, let it sort of like run away. And an easy way of warming up is to take uh, a subject that you love or something that you hate and then write a short, rude poem about it. Yeah, it's, it's very, very easy. I mean, anything with a strong emotion attached to it. Like me, I love chips. I could write a lovely love poem about chips. Oh, I love you, chips. I love the taste of chips upon my lips. I hope that the chips I eat with my lips won't go straight to my hips. You know, it's, it's like, I mean, it's not a great poem, is it? But, you know, it's, you know, it's getting me warmed up. Um, similarly, you know, obviously, clearly, I, I, I hate vampire cucumbers, you know, and I hate general cucumbers. So imagine if I'd leapt to my feet in front of Mrs. Irison and said, Cucumber! It's a good start, yeah? Fact, factually accurate start, yeah. Cucumber! Take a Luke cumber. You're not even a funny juke cumber. You make me want to puke cumber. You make me want to go nuke cumber. I'm gonna smack you, drac you cumber. I'm gonna kick your drac you bumber. Your biting days are cuke numbered. Yeah, clever one, yeah. Pathetic poo poo cumber! <laughs> Sorry, that's a bit, a bit juvenile. Either. So, yeah, poo to you, cumber! Yeah? At which point, so roasted by my words, this Count Dracula cumber, he bursts into flame, runs across the school hall, aye, smacks into the wall, explodes into blazing cucumbery chunks. <laughs> Mrs. Irison says, eat it. Yeah, she probably, she probably would. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, she probably would. But, you know, I would have had some fun. She might have even smiled. She might have let me off eating it. We'll never know now. We'll never know. I went straight for the, uh, the bad fib. I should have gone for the entertaining lie. That might have helped. But, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, it's just the past. I look back and I think, yeah, it's sort of like that thing about, you know, making up stuff about things that kind of like worry you and upset you. you know, laughing at our problems is a, is a useful skill. It's a good life skill. Um, and it can help us with our writing as well. And another sort of like key part of this, um, I was mentioned in the introduction, and that was uh, that I, I really did love Doctor Who very much. And I used to make up my own Doctor Who stories as well. We see one here, Doctor Who and the Mitex Power. Obviously a very, very exciting and thrilling story. Um, I, was, uh, I was 11 by this point, so uh, let's see if my writing's improved. Chapter 6. The Doctor had the feeling of being half asleep, half awake, and a migraine. <laughs> it hasn't improved, has it? No, it really hasn't. <laughs> then... He was in a metal room, bare. No, what, he was bare? Oh, no, oh, no, sorry, the metal room was bare. It's right, Doctor Who wasn't bare. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Uh, if he was. No, no windows, doors, no furniture, just a four-walled room. My powers of description were superb, even at that age. <laughs> All is ready, O oh Master, for your transformation, said Nyssa. Good. I would not like to keep my guest waiting. Ha, ha. Pull the lever and go, my faithful servant. Nyssa pulled the lever and went. <laughs> In a flash, the voice belonged to a being of flesh and blood. Come, Doctor. The Doctor appeared. Let the test begin. The being the Doctor saw before him was brown, with a curved horn on his forehead. He had cloven hands and feet like a devil. Cloven hands, that's impressive. Um, a blue streak of smoke appeared between the two aliens' foreheads as each opponent pitted his will against the other. 
and the penalty for losing the macabre game was dot 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 death in capital letters. And as you can see there, it's like it's, it's, it's kind of it's all it's all going on. So yes, I would spend Saturday uh, afternoons. Uh, on lovely sunny days, sitting in the lounge with the curtains closed, writing my own Doctor Who stories and illustrating them too, of course, because that's how we rolled back in the early 1980s. Um, because in those dark days, you won't believe it now, in those dark days, there was only three TV channels. Three TV channels. You couldn't, like, binge watch anything. You couldn't download it or stream it or record it and watch it later. Three TV channels. It didn't even show TV all the time. It didn't. I mean, Often, for hours at a time, there would be something called the test card. <laughs> See, there's some of the older people in the room are remembering that. The test card. And I, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. It was a, all it was was one picture for hours with music playing over the top. And the picture, who chose it? The picture was a girl playing noughts and crosses with a clown puppet. Right? And the, 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 the game was like frozen at like the halfway point. It was unclear who was who was like noughts and who was crosses. We never knew who was like in the winning position, who was. I didn't know what was happening because like the clown was there. It, it was a horrible clown. It was like this nasty face with like I think it had a beret or something, and like a green sort of smock. And the girl had this enigmatic smile on her face, like a Mona Lisa smile. It was almost like I've just let one go and no one knows it. <laughs> or or maybe maybe she knew something secret about the clown. I mean I was always I was always fascinated by the power dynamics going on in this situation. I mean, after a while I became terrified. If I took my eyes off the screen, the next time I'd look back, that clown puppet would be right up in the middle of the screen going Aah! like that. It was a horrifying thought, you know? It was like scary. I'd watch that for hours, it was, it was ridiculous. But the thing was, you see, if you missed the programme you wanted to watch, that was it. You didn't get to see it again. It wasn't repeated. You couldn't sort of like just catch up, and there was no catch up telly. So it was, it was, it was pretty tough. Um, and uh, Doctor Who was like one 25 minute episode every week for about half the year. And the rest of the time it was just off, you couldn't watch it. So you had to either read the books, which I did, write the books, which I also did, uh, because it was a way of just sort of like getting that Doctor Who fix. And again, you see, I was, I was quite, you know, I, I was a nervous child. I was scared of many things and, uh, and I was scared of Doctor Who. As much as I loved it, I was also terrified of it. Because, you know, Doctor Who was like different alien invaders. I mean, these days it's, it's, it's a very different thing. But back then, aliens were always invading southern England. <laughs> just outside London, generally, it seemed to me. And I was like, hang on a minute. That's where I am. <laughs> that means aliens could be invading this place any minute. I've just seen it on TV, after all. There's like Zygons loose with like, you know, giant Loch Ness monsters who swam down to the Thames, apparently. There's like Kraals building like android villages just outside London. There's like Daleks invading. They're always invading outside London. And I was like, scared of Daleks. You know, you must be, I'm, sure, I'm sure you all know Daleks. You know, they look like big, big sort of like dustbins with like, you know, sucker pipes and like gun sticks and they have scary voices. So I was scared. And I don't know if you find this, some of you in the room, but um, during the day when it's sunny, your bedroom is a lovely, happy place. It's got all your lovely favourite things in it and you feel safe and secure there. But when the light goes out late at night, suddenly that bedroom is less warm. Like it's suddenly it's a little bit kind of like, this is a little bit creepy in here. I need the light on. I need a light on. Just be reminded that all the things that were there when the light was on are still there in the dark, because otherwise there could be some, some monster waiting there saying, hi. But <laughs> like, well, you have to ask yourself, what is, it, what is so special about you that you get the only monster ever reported to actually appear like this? See, I never, I know, my, you know, my ego was such that I was convinced that if the Daleks invaded, they would come to my house. Well, of course they would. You know, they would get upstairs somehow, because Daleks couldn't fly in the old days. Um, they'd have been standing at the bottom of the stairs saying, this is embarrassing. You know, but, but, <laughs> But, you know, I was... So my dad would come in, you know, sort of, you know, late at night, you know, after, on a Saturday night after Doctor Who, you know, and I'd be like, you know, lying in bed, he'd say, no, no, Steve, okay. <laughs> so you're right, Steve. <laughs> sure, you know. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> sure, there's nothing. I'm scared of Daleks! You know, it's like... <laughs> and I had to sort of, like, confess that I was very scared of Daleks. And he said to me, he gave me some good advice so I'm going to pass on. He said, if there's something that scares you, just imagine it wearing a large pair of pink frilly pants. <laughs> because suddenly it becomes less, less scary, if you imagine that. So imagine that Dalek sort of like rumbling into my room like there, wearing enormous pink frilly knickers. <laughs> I mean, Daleks don't even have any legs. How is he even wearing the pants? It's, it's doubly ridiculous. Like, they're just sort of like... And it would probably be, I'd look at it, I'd probably start laughing. Say, How dare you laugh at my pants? You know, 
Um, you know, so it's like, you'd probably like back away blushing, you know, so that would, that would be all right. And so it was, it was useful advice. It was useful advice. Um, but uh, it made me think, yeah, maybe sort of like, you know, and I remember the thing about the vampire cucumbers, like laughing at the things that scare us. Now, I, uh, the tragedy of the ukulele is that uh, we had a beautiful mercy dash to do it. I was told that we had to start um, 10 o'clock sharp. And unfortunately, this is a very out of tune ukulele. It's so out of tune. I'm not going to be able to play it. Uh, so sorry for that, because you went racing off to get it. But unfortunately, if I, if I do uh, perform my alien stink song, it's not going to come out very, very well. Or actually, maybe I'll add a little sinister edge to it. You know, I've never tried it, but we might, we might try that. Um, but yeah, it's what I was saying about laughing and like, you know, being a bit rude about the things that you hate. This is a song I wrote when I was 11 years old. Anyone 11 in the room today? Well, there you go. Anyone been 11 recently? Yeah, anyone gonna be 11 at some point? Yeah. Anyone been 11 in their whole life? It's amazing how it brings us all together, the number 11, isn't it? It's, it's extraordinary. Um, but yeah, um, I wrote this little poem, um, this little song. I put it to music because um, I wish I was interested in, in that sort of thing. I'm still in a band, actually, although I play slightly different songs on, on better tuned instruments now. But uh, there's, only, there's only three chords in this. There's like a C, there's a D7, there's an F. None of those are, are, are there. Uh, but uh, it, went, it went like this. <laughs> I, can't, I can't bring myself to do it. Um, <laughs> entertain it there would be. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can tune that one up later. Um, but it went like this. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll perform it for you. Like, uh, you know, it's like... I've been to outer space. Now there's an alien on my face. There's an alien on my toes. There's an alien up my nose. There's an alien on my tum. There's an alien on my... Straight in with the bum. Thank you, Luton. It could have been thumb. Yes, thank you. It could have been on... Gum. On my, oh, my gum. Oh, yeah, could, yeah, imagine that. Yeah, nice one, alias on my gum. Could be an alien on my, on my mum. Could be there's an alien on my mum's bum. How dare you bring my mother's bum into this? That's outrageous. Wash your mouths up. Um, Although, from the top of the hat factory, on a clear day, you can actually see my mum's bum, actually, over there, over there in Bedford. Anyway, that's... Sorry, that's very rude about my mum. Um, it's actually lost some weight. Slimming world. It's, it's worked well. Um, anyway, where were we? Yeah. Um, there's an alien in my hair. Explaining a lot. There's aliens everywhere. And the catchy chorus went... Oh! It's building up to it. Oh! I hate aliens. Smelly little aliens. I think aliens stink. I hate aliens, smelly little aliens. I think aliens stink. Oh, I hate aliens, smelly little aliens. I think aliens stink. I hate aliens, smelly little aliens. I think aliens... Stink. Exactly. Verse 2. There's an alien on my chin. There's an alien licking my skin. There's an alien on my hips. There's an alien kissing my lips. There's an alien over my heart. And I think he's doing a forward roll <laughs> before you even start. Yeah. There's an alien in my shoe. Uh oh. Uh oh. And I think. <laughs> is he doing a poo? Is he being to the loo? Or is he just saying, how do you do? <laughs> Aha! See, it's always good to do the unexpected, to take your reader or your audience by surprise. Um, and then it went back to that catchy chorus, which said, Oh, I hate aliens, smelly little aliens, I think aliens stink. I hate aliens, smelly little aliens, I think aliens stink. Oh, I hate blah, 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 blah. And that's how it went. Um, and um, it loses something in the translation of it. But it's interesting, isn't it, how these things, they get in sort of like ingrained in our heads. Because, you know, we only sort of like watch these things, you know, for like things like Doctor Who was only, as I say, 25 minutes a week. And, and even more important than that to me at that time, when I was very small, was the Spider-Man cartoon. Now... Again, remember that I'm very old, and so when I was young, the only Spider-Man on TV, you know, was that little, that little cartoon that was on, you know, the really rubbishy one. You know, it was before, you know, Tom Holland and before Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield and all the cool Spider-Men. It kind of like went right back to this little cartoon. But it, nevertheless, it did have the best theme music. Do you know the one that went, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, you know, does whatever a spider can, yeah. 
Spins a web, any size, catches seeds just like flies. Look out, there goes a Spider-Man. See, tablets and blood, he's got radioactive blood. Can he spring from a thread? Take a look overhead, head, there goes a Spider-Man. In the still of night, the scene of the crime, like a streak of light, he arrives just in time. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, friendly to Spider-Man. Wealth and fame, he's ignored. Action is his reward. To him, life is a great big hang. Wherever there's a bang-up, you'll find the Spider-Man. I think it went something like that. Because, <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that gets the applause. The Alien song was rubbish, but that gets the applause. I didn't even write that one. Thanks a bunch. Um, but yeah, uh, this is it. And because I know that because I watched it, you know, I haven't watched it since, but I watched it. I used to wait every, you know, all through the week for a Saturday morning to come along. I'd be up there before, before the TV thing had started and I'd be waiting for it to come on. Um, and again, these days, if you ever want to dress up like Spider-Man, it's easy for you, isn't it? You just go out, you just get, buy a Spidey suit from the supermarket. It's even got padded muscles in it. Yeah, so you look, you really look the part. Yeah, it's fantastic. With a proper cloth mask and everything. Ah, oh, look at that, and I, I, I'm so envious, I want to weep, I want to rage. When I was small, all I could do was, I, I was wear my pyjamas. That was my Spider-Man. My pyjamas tucked into my football socks, yeah, with this plastic half mask that was clearly meant for a much bigger person than me, because it looked like you know, this little, little body with this massive head, about like two-thirds of the body, most, a third was head, it was ridiculous. But I'd be there. In my imagination, I was Spider-Man, you know, and I was like, I was poised for action. And as soon as that music came on, dun, 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 as soon as that came on, normally someone was watching with me, you know, my mum or my dad or my sister were watching with me. But on that occasion, <laughs> no one was. And so the little switch tripped in my head and I became Spider Man. So I ran around the room going, Spider Man, Spider Man. You know, so, so I accidentally jumping on the coffee table in the lounge, does whatever a spider cat, you know, and like springing on the curtain, spins away, and he sides. You know. I was just completely carried away. I was only sort of four or five or something. Cat to see, he says, I'm jumping on the sofa. My dad comes in, what are you doing? Go to your room. But daddy's spider cat, go to your room. But I'm going to watch spider Go to your room. I'm going to watch spider Go to your room. I had to go to my room, thinking, how unfair is this? This never happens to the real Spider-Man, does it? You not see what I was dressed as? It never happens to the real Spider-Man. You never see Spider-Man like battling the Green Goblin and Aunt May coming out saying, "No, nah, no, nah, Spider-Man, you very naughty boy, go to your room." <laughs> Doesn't happen, does it? You know, it's like shake hands with the Green Goblin. No, no, I'm not going to shake hands with the Green Goblin. Oh. I hate you, Goblin. <laughs> that doesn't happen, you know, because superheroes have their own powers, you know, and that's what I kind of wanted. I wanted to have those superheroic abilities, you know. I, mean, I really like Spider-Man. I like the way that, you know, Peter Parker was like, you know, this regular guy he had problems like me, you know, he sort of like, he was a bit of a sort of like weed, like me. Um, never picked for sports, like me. Um, and, uh, but, and yet he could turn into Spider-Man, had all these powers, and people were envious of Spider-Man, but they didn't care much for Peter Parker, but, you know, he, he could impress them. I think, you know, some of us can relate to that. Um, the other superhero I really, really liked was The Incredible Hulk, um, because, uh, you know, he also had a really cool TV show on in the 1970s, and the great thing about the Hulk is, well, I mean, can anyone name me the guy who becomes the Hulk? Hands up, who's the name, who's the name, what's the name of the guy who becomes the Hulk? Yeah. Um, it wasn't it like Bruce Banner? It was Bruce Banner, yeah, Bruce Banner on TV, he was David Bruce Banner, but yeah, Bruce Banner. Uh, like in the comics. And, you know, he was sort of accidentally bombarded with gamma radiation, which altered his body chemistry, so whenever he becomes angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. He becomes the Incredible Hulk. So his skin changes colour. What colour does, does his skin turn? Yes? Green. Green, that's right. It turns green. It gets uh, huge muscles. You know, it sort of rips out of his shirt. Luckily, doesn't rip out of his trousers as well. That would be, that would be embarrassing. I am Hulk. It's like, whoa. No one needs to see that Hulk. All kinds of big green wrong going on over there. Um, but the weird thing is, his trousers do rip, but down here. Why? That's the thinnest part of the leg. Why is that bit ripped? The thigh area, which in the Hulk is frankly enormous, that bit's fine. It's this bit that struggles. What's going on? In the early stages of transformation, the Hulk's car muscles go whoa like that, swell up like weather balloons and like you know, rip the fabric. It's the only explanation. It's got magic calves. I don't know what's happening there. Um, so, uh, you know, it's. And it's difficult, because I mean, again, in the 1970s, you couldn't get one of those nice, cool Hulk dress-up costumes with the ripped shirt and everything and the big padded muscles. And you can even get, like, plastic fists, green fists. And when you hit a wall, it makes, like, a noise, like an explosion, like you're smashing through the wall. I'd have killed for one of those. I had to set off a painting myself green. <laughs> one time I did it, it was not a good plan. Um, I only had those paints you sometimes get them at schools. You know what I mean? They look like ice hockey pucks. You know what I mean? By, you, you know those ones? They're rubbish. You know? And my brush, the head on my brush was literally about that big. And I was like, like painting them. You know, it's taken ages. You know? So in the end, I just sort of like wet my hands and I rubbed it on the, on the, on the ice hockey puck. And I sort of like smeared it on. You know? So I sort of, all over, sort of tried to get all over the back, you know, the face and everything. I mean, there's lots of splashes on the floor. But you know, it's water soluble. Mum will be fine with that. That'll be fine. 
was a bit on the carpet, I admit. Um, so, you know, I, and obviously that was this, this tiny, skinny thing, but, you know, painting green, that sort of looked pretty good. I thought, well, you know, I need to be able to rip through my shirt. My muscles aren't going to do it, so I need to... Uh, I need a ripped shirt. But I like all my shirts. But I have an older sister. Oh. And I don't like her very much. <laughs> and she has shirts. <laughs> so, yeah, I... My sister had three school shirts, just plain white shirts, and I thought, she doesn't need three. It's only five days in the school week. Surely one shirt for three days and one for two days is enough. I took the shirt and I took my mum's dressmaking scissors with a serrated edge and I cut them up and I sort of like, oh, it makes a satisfying sound, the ripping fabric. Oh, it's good, it's good. I ripped, ripped this shirt to smithereen. It's brilliant. It's like scraps of shirt. I put it on and I think, yeah, now I'm starting to feel like I'm really strong. But we all know about the Hulk's magic trousers, don't we? His magic calf muscles to rip out there. I couldn't be satisfied. Even though it was the 1970s, I was wearing flares. I still needed to, uh, to, to attack those. So I thought, well, you know, I only had one pair of jeans. So I thought, well, you know, I can still wear them just because they've got like, you know, a bit of, bit of ventilation in the, uh, the bottom there. I can still wear them, surely. Um, no one could object to that. So I, I got the, the dressmaking scissors and the hard bit is the hem. The hem's the hard bit to cut through. Once you got through there, you can tear it up. It makes a very satisfying, heavy ripping sound, you know? So I thought, yeah, brilliant. Now I've got the ripped, I've got the ripped jeans, I've got the shredded shirt, I've got painted green. I'm going to go down to the kitchen and give my mum a big surprise. <laughs> so I went up behind my poor mother in the kitchen and I went, Arr. Now, my mum turned around. Now, do you think she said to me, A, that's a very impressive Hulk costume, Steve. Done very well with a limited budget there. I'm um, impressed with your ingenuity and resourcefulness. Um, well done. Or do you think she said, B, <laughs> It's like you know my mother. Yeah, she did. She sent me to my room, and it's like so unfair. You know, you wouldn't do that to the real Hulk, would you? Hulk, go to your room. No, Hulk smash room. <laughs> it's, like, it's not gonna work, is it? Hulk, hurry up in the bathroom, time to go to school. No, Hulk smash school. <laughs> That's the great thing, the genius of the Hulk is that, you know, you're an ordinary person, then you get angry, and you sort of like turn into this monster that smashes whatever's bothering him. And then you turn back to normal again. Say, what happened here? I don't know, some big green monster came along. It's like, it's nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with me. It must be this, uh, this whole thing here. Um, so, you know, Doctor Who, superheroes, they had this, 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 this huge effect on me. Just check what, 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 what the time is. This game It's like pretty too good. We've got plenty of time yet. Um, they had these big effects on me, you know? Um, and it wasn't just Doctor Who that sort of like stopped writing out. I sort of like carried on going. I just used to like making up stories. Not really to show to anyone in particular. I never showed my parents or uh, my teachers or anything like that. I just used to like... And I'm writing this stuff for myself. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, you know, if, does anyone know what they want to do when you're older? Hands up. Kids, who wants to do, what do you want to do? What do you want to do when you're older? I want to be an author and comedian. You want to be an author and comedian? It's rubbish. <laughs> it's rubbish. You know, I wouldn't bother. This guy. Um, I'm kidding, of course. Yes. An author and an illustrator. I can see you're illustrating right now. That's, that's very good. That's very good. Anyone? Else? You don't know what to do when you're older. No. I know, I'm still, I'm still hedging my bets, believe me, yeah, I've, I've no idea. Some of us know, some of us don't know, it's not a problem. Um, you've got a lot of time ahead of you. The thing was, I didn't know what I wanted to do um, at, at the end of school, so I went to university uh, for three years to, uh, to put off the inevitable. Uh, I went to university for three years and I, uh, I did English literature and film degree, um, which is excellent qualification for serving Big Mac and fries. Uh, but nevertheless, I didn't want to do that either very much, um, so... I ended up, after university, coming to Luton. I came to Luton and I worked for BBC Radio Bedfordshire with hearts and bucks, as it was known then. Now it's, of course, BBC Three Counties. Back then it was not. Uh, and in fact, I owe my entire career, such as it is, to a Blue Peter presenter called Simon Groom, which some people in the audience may remember. He was, uh, you know, he was, you know, a long time ago before you younger people. Um, but Blue Peter was still going. And Simon Groom, uh, we had this dog called Goldie, and he, sort of his parents had a farm. You know, he seemed like a, quite a nice figure. It was like quite weird, sort of like working on Simon Groom's show. Simon, bless him. Anyone related to Simon? <laughs> no, good, we can carry on. Um, <laughs> Simon, bless him, was kind of like Alan Partridge before Alan Partridge. Um, I tried to fit a quarter of a pint pot on the Good Morning Show today. He was, he was, he was great. Um, but he did have this, did have this temper, and 
I was, uh, I was working, I was doing work experience, so I was having to drive 35 miles from where I lived, the other side of Bedford, to get to Luton each day, and his show started at 10 o'clock. So I could sometimes only get there once you battled through the rush hour after doing my paper round. You know, I could only get there for about, you know, sort of like, you know, 20 past nine. And he was giving me nice jobs. I was going out, I was interviewing people with, uh, you know, sort of like interviews for the radio. That was quite exciting. I was going to edit my own things with like, in those days, it was still on reel-to-reel tape. We had to use razor blades and all sort of like splices to make it work. It was great. Um, but one time, Normally, he'd be saying, oh, get me Sean Connery's wig maker or something like that, and like asking me things like that. But then one time, the phone remained resolutely dead throughout the three-hour Good Morning show. And I was summoned at the end of it downstairs to see Simon Green. And he went beetroot red. And you know, you know my feelings about beetroot. Yeah. It's like, it tapped into a lot of stuff for me. Yeah. Um, he went beetroot red, and he was like, no, I think you do not wrong. I was going to give you a good reference, I won't now! He was actually shouting. And it's, it's, it's odd when you're shouted at someone you know from your childhood watching TV. It's kind of like, it's one thing someone random shouting at you, but it's another thing when it's someone that you grew up watching on the telly. So I was like, this is quite surreal. I was like, in the end, I actually had to walk out and like, and just because it was just so odd. I was being, he, was, he just wasn't stopping. So I went upstairs and I clearly must have looked quite, you know, quite alarmed. And he said, are you all right, Steve? I said, yeah, I've just been really shouted at by Simon Groom. And they went, oh, yeah, that does happen, yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, we'll take you off his show and we'll pay you to work on the news desk instead, which means you get a BBC staff number, which means you can apply for the BBC's internal jobs that they don't advertise to anybody. You can go there. And I thought, oh, this is my secret key. <laughs> this is my secret key to future employment. Suddenly, I was no longer just Stephen Cole. I was Stephen Cole, BBC staff number 298878A. I still remember it after all these years. And... All the, all the juicy jobs, all the jobs. I, thought, I just need a job that doesn't require any experience. That's all I need, because I have no experience. So I went for those jobs and I saw the job of my dreams awaiting me. It was junior assistant on Noddy magazine. <laughs> oh yeah, I am that cool. Yeah, I worked on Noddy magazine. Um, you know Noddy, he's the little man with the red and yellow car, little blue hat, bell on the end. Jingle, jingle, I'm little Noddy, because he nods his head. Jingle, 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 like that, yeah. Um, now, Noddy was created by an author called Enid Blyton. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of Enid Blyton. Um, and she wrote a lot of books, obviously, a lot of books. Um, and working also as the consultant editor on Noddy magazine was Enid Blyton's daughter, whose name was Gillian, Gillian Baverstock. <laughs> Gillian Baverstock, because she married a man called Donald Baverstock, who was controller of BBC One back in 1963. He commissioned Doctor Who for the BBC. I was more excited by that than I was about Noddy, I confess. But Donald was without the picture, and Gillian was a, was a, was a lovely old lady. Um, and we'd have meetings there in Enid Blyton's offices, and all Enid Blyton's books were around the room, and Enid Blyton's old typewriter was on a shelf in the middle of the room. The typewriter on which she had written, you know, up to 10,000 words a day sometimes. All these stories, all these stories. I mean, one of her daughters still liked her, one of her daughters really didn't like her, because Enid was a little bit mean to her daughters. She, would, she didn't have much time for them, so she would kind of like write all day, and then they'd be looked after by you know, a governess or a, or a nanny, and then they'd, uh, they'd be able to meet mother and father after, after their tea. Enid would put the clock hands forward an hour, so they thought it was an hour nearer their bedtime than it was. So she got them out of the way. It's not a bad trick, some of the answers. Uh, so they thought, it was uh, later than it was, so she could get rid of them, basically, and pack them off to bed early on. Um, quite, a, quite a mean trick. Anyway, I saw that typewriter, and I realised all these stories that he'd written, and I remembered Doctor Who and the Mitex Power, and I remembered the Peter and Anne adventures, and I remembered all the stories that I'd written since, and I thought, yeah, I used to actually quite enjoy that. That was an escape for me from some of the, uh, the sort of, like, the scariness in life, some of the, sort of, like, the worst experiences, because you could lose yourself in a story, you know? So, I thought, maybe I should start writing again, and so, because... Noddy Magazine was not where the story ended, of course. Soon, we were publishing Pingu Magazine. <laughs> meh, meh, you know, that little hero of the South Pole, yeah. And Spot the Dog. And Toy Box Magazine, which had, like, Postman Pat and Fireman Sam and all sorts of different things in it. Um, and so we needed... Uh, and Play Days. There's a programme called Play Days, which kind of, like, was a sequel to Play School. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'd need poems and we would need little stories for that. And, because we didn't have much money to pay people to do them, I started writing them myself. And I wrote, um, I sent some of these examples off to a publisher and said, you know, when you did little poem books, and they said, they actually got back to me really quickly and said, would you like to write these four little poem pop-up books for us? And I was like, yes, I would. 
And so I wrote these four little poem pop-up books, and I thought, how nice. I've written some books. So I'm a magazine editor, and I've written some books. And then a job appeared on the floor above me at BBC Worldwide. And that job was Doctor Who book editor. <laughs> and I thought, wait a second here. This could be good, because I know a little bit about Doctor Who. And I quite like Doctor Who. Maybe I could work on Doctor Who. And uh, that's what I did. I ended up being the Doctor Who book editor and having to commission lots and lots of Doctor Who books. If you had sort of like told the boy who wrote Doctor Who and the Mitex Power that one day he would be not just editing Doctor Who books, but writing his own Doctor Who books as well. Um, what an extraordinary thing to go through. And the point is, there would be no this if there hadn't been this. So all of you in this room, whoever have the idea of picking up your pens and writing a little story in pencil, even if it's not very good, what you're doing is you're practising and you're opening up doors for your own future. Because maybe you will get a BBC staff number, maybe you won't. Maybe you don't need one at all. Maybe you will end up writing stuff for your own enjoyment and you'll find that other people enjoy it as well. Maybe you'll be able to write something that will just chime with other people and give you all sorts of ideas. Um, and because you've uh, written lots of books like, like I have, maybe you'll end up working with, uh, with interesting people like astronauts, like Tim Peake, the astronaut. He's a lovely, lovely fella. Um, uh, we've written three books together so far. Swarm Rising, which was the, the first of the Swarm books. I mean, you'd have to read them in any order. Um, and the new book that came out in August. Um, a little alien <laughs> intervention there. Um, so, yeah, so you can, you can get to work with interesting people as well. But for me, the thing that I find most extraordinary is that when I was eight years old, at Bedford Central Library, an author called Terence Dix came to speak to us. And Terence Dix wrote a lot of the Doctor Who books that I was reading. And I remember thinking, I really, really want your job. And he came back to Bedford Central Library when I was 13. And I went to see him again. And I thought, I still really, really want your job. Um, and then when I became the BBC Doctor Who books editor, who was the first author I got to edit and work with? Terence Dix. Yeah, that guy that I'd seen at the library was now I was working with him, and he ended up dedicating a Doctor Who book to me, to Steve Cole, an editorial raft in the stormy sea of deadline, was what it said. And I thought, wow, isn't it amazing the journey that books can take us on? We go from being a reader to being a writer to working with the people we were reading when we were younger. Books can take us in all sorts of interesting directions which is why I'm very, very happy that Luton now has its very own literary festival, uh, offering and uh, increasing the chances of, uh, of people getting into books and finding out stuff from it. And some of you watching me today, you uh, may remember that guy who inexplicably stood in a strange pose for 30 seconds. <laughs> you may remember him. You, know, you might, you might. And you might think, do you remember that weird guy who kind of stood in that weird pose for no reason at all? And, uh, and that might set you thinking, oh, yeah, I used to write stories back then. Maybe I'll start writing them again. You never know. That might that might happen. Um, so I've kind of like I've kind of glossed over like the, the main part I should have talked about probably, which is the books I've written over the last twenty odd years. But that's what questions are for. So does anyone have any questions they would like to ask me? If they want to sort of like brave themselves speaking in the arena as a as a lady there. Yes. What's your question? Are you still scared of clowns? Am I still scared of clowns? Obviously. <laughs> Who isn't scared of clowns? They're very scary things. I'm I'm baffled as to why anyone thinks clowns are like entertaining. Frankly. It's like you've got someone who's like masking their appearance, wearing like this, this massive like shock of hair, and it's got a huge nose. Like, and the, oh, and, and how funny, going, it's like, we all know that clowns are just like one tiny step away from turning into like something really, really dreadful and scary, so yeah. But I find scarier than clowns, sharks. Sharks. I used to, when I was 11, I was terrified that someone was going to put a shark in my bed. <laughs> Why? Why was I scared of that? Well, it's because I saw Jaws too early. I saw this, this film called Jaws. It was, you know, I was, I, I thought, oh, you know, people were saying it was really scary. I thought, I bet it's fine. It's just about a shark. It's awful. People get bitten in half. It was like, oh, it's dreadful. And I was terrified. And, but somehow I was thinking, can you imagine the logistical challenge of threatening a boy in his bed with a shark? Someone would have to kind of like hear about my fear, drive with a shark over there in a trailer with a big tank in it, presumably. You'd have to lug that tank out the back of the truck, on a, some sort of trolley, presumably, somehow get into the house. And then he's thinking, oh, I've got to get up the stairs now. It's like dragging this tank with a shark in up the stairs. I'm sleeping soundly in my bed at all this point. Finally opening my bedroom door, 
And then he's got, he's got to lift the shark out himself, hasn't he? Or herself. You know, it's like, like this floppity shark going around. And then somehow he's got to stick it under the duvet. I mean, the shark by this point is going to be terrified, isn't it? He's going, what's going on? He's going to be more scared than I am, probably. Nevertheless, I was terrified of that shark. I knew it would come to get me. Probably driven by a clown. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, so, yes, yeah, but by making fun of those fears uh, and writing little things about them, they are ways to inspire us. We have another, another question. Yeah, do you want to well, pick some? You choose. Um, well, here. Right. One time when I was little, something rather funny happened, honestly. I know how to swim now, but when I was little, I felt a bit too confident and was like, why don't I try and swim? Because we were meant, because the teacher asked if we could swim and <laughs> inspire. So I went in there and I nearly drowned. <gasps> yeah. The teacher came out and, and came in and saved me, luckily. I'm not like a hallucination. I'm glad that, I, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a spoiler to the story, but I guess you're, yeah. you're here, so that's, <laughs> that's good news. And then, and uh, then, yeah, I got in trouble. For you got in it. trouble because you said you could swim and you couldn't. Well, yeah. I, I know, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I mean, I, I was, I was once swept away by a flood in my, in my, in Oakley actually, yeah, where I, where I lived. I don't know where my parents were. I mean, my sister had gone down to the river and it was flooded, and it was flooded right up to the, uh, the first step. So I thought it was going to be shallow, like sort of like walking into a thing. So I sort of stepped in, and went sproosh, and I went swept away. Some, some teenage boy jumped in and saved me. But you know, the tragedy was, I lost my Wellington boot. One boot was swept away, taken by the flood, never to be found again. Um, it, was a, it was a terrifying thought. But yeah, so I, I, I share your pain. Did you actually have a question as well? Or I, were you just... I was just going to say that I also had a bit of a bad thing with potatoes with, as well. With potatoes. And they, and they used to rush <laughs> the other vegetables into the potato to do the exact same thing. They would go, eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, you, I share your pain. I share your pain. I mean, I don't understand the potato thing. <laughs> oh, a question over there. Yes. Were you counting how many times you got told off by your parents? Was I counting how many times I got told off by my parents? How could anyone count to infinity? <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible, I tell you. But yeah, I, I did used to get into you know, not meaning. I wasn't like a naughty boy, but I'd somehow just, just yeah, things would happen to me. Yes. What's your favourite book that you've written? Oh, my favourite book that I've written. Well. I once wrote uh, a series of books called Astrosaurs, about dinosaurs in space. And I got the idea from watching a TV show called Walking with Dinosaurs. Um, and I was having to write some books about walking with dinosaurs, because after I'd done the Doctor Who thing, I started writing books for other TV shows and films, like The Incredibles and Madagascar and Shrek and stuff like that. And I was writing some books for um, Walking with Dinosaurs, and I got quite sad when all the dinosaurs, you know, I realised they were all wiped out by that big meteor hitting 65 million years ago. What a terrible shame. Um, and I remember saying to my boss, you know, wouldn't it be a much happier ending to the dinosaur's story if, if it turns out they've been cleverer than anyone guessed? And maybe they saw this enormous lump of rock hurtling towards the planet 65 million years ago and thinking rather than stick around and get squished, let's build a fleet of spaceships, take off and start a new life out there amongst the stars. It's when they stopped being dinosaurs, started being astrosaurs. And you know, it's like, Sometimes little, uh, the good idea light bulb comes over your head, Bing! like that. You think, ooh, astrosaurs, Bing! I should totally write a book called Astrosaurs, Bing! like that. And uh, it was such a good idea, I ignored it completely <laughs> for four years. Four years I ignored that idea. Um, but it wouldn't go away. It kept putting his hand up in my head saying, hello, astrosaurs. And I'd say, shut up, I'm writing something else at the moment. I'm writing about Shrek, shut up. And I'd say, hello, astrosaurs. I said, shut up, I'm having my tea now, aren't I? I'm having my tea. No salad, some potato, sorry. Um, and I'll tell you, hello, I just, shut up! I'll say, astrosaurs, astrosaurs, blah, blah, blah. Fine, I'll write an astrosaurs story. And I finally did, just really to sort of like shut up that little voice in my head. But you know, the weird thing was that suddenly, three publishers wanted to publish this silly idea about the dinosaurs in space. And they were offering like, write three books, write four books. And so I did, I took a deal that offered me four books, and then I wrote another four, and I ended up writing 23 astrosaurs stories. 23 of them. Um, and then an eight Astrosaurs Academy book, which is where dinosaurs go to learn how to become astrosaurs. So this silly idea that I had from watching a TV show um, and ignored for all those years turned out to be the idea that changed my life. It was the idea that stopped me writing about other people's characters and stuff, unless I wanted to, um, and writing about my own. So I think I will always think that the very first Astrosaurs book, The Riddle of the Raptors, uh, is probably my favourite book because it's the book that, uh, that pushed me in another direction. And sometimes ideas can do that. Yes? Do you have 
any idea what you're going to um, write the next book? Oh, do I have any idea what I'm going to write the next book? <laughs> yeah, I need to write the next book. Last week, really. <laughs> I've been, I've been a bit, I've been a bit late lately. Um, I had a couple of weeks off with COVID, and it kind of didn't didn't do my my deadlines much many favours. Weirdly, I've just been working on a, uh, a novelisation of um, some Blake Seven episodes. Blake Seven is a very old science fiction program. Some older people in the room saying, "Oh, Blake Seven, yeah, that was rubbish." Um, but you know, and it, and it was a bit. But you know, it was lo lovely rubbish. The nine-year-old me couldn't turn down a job like that. So yes, I've just done that, and I'm just about to write another book with Tim Peake. Um, our first non-fiction book comes out next month. It's called the. Uh, the Cosmic Diary of Our Incredible Universe, aged 13.8 billion years. Uh, and it's like the, basically the universe's secret diary, telling you what happened from the Big Bang right the way through to possibly the, uh, the universe's end in the far, 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 far future. Um, and we're writing another one called The Space Explorer's Handbook, so that will be the next, the next book I am writing. Um, and uh, yes... Uh, four more questions, I'm going to try and fit them all in. Okay. Right, and three minutes. Four questions, three minutes. Let's go. Are you still scared of Doctor Who? Am I still scared of Doctor Who? Now I'm scared of Doctor Who deadlines, because they come along quite quickly. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still uh, BBC Books consultant editor for the Doctor Who range, which means that I do get to uh, read the scripts in advance. I've just read the, the script for the special that comes out next year. I'm so excited. Um, it's going to be good, people. It's going to be good. Um, so, yeah, next one. Next. Have you ever voice acted any movies? Have you ever voice acted anything? Um, well, you know, once I was the voice of a Dalek for a trailer for BBC Doctor Who videos. I had to say things like, presenting a new dimension of adventure for Doctor Who. But I was speaking into the proper ring modulator, this funny bit of, bit of equipment that turns your voice into a Dalek voice. From BBC Worldwide! It was great fun, actually. It was good fun. Yes? When you were young, what was your dream job? When I was young, my dream job? I wanted to be a firefighter. But look at me, that was never going to happen, was it? I've had, I've had four hernias. I literally have had four hernias. Uh, so I wanted to be a firefighter, that didn't happen, so I realised maybe something which involved less, less running around being heroic. Um, although, you know, I get paper cuts sometimes, that's quite heroic. Yes? Did you still have to eat Count Dracucumber? <laughs> no, I didn't have to eat Count Dracucumber. I got away with that. What annoys me is that sometimes they put big long strips of cucumber into water. Oh. What? <laughs> like they flavoured the water with cucumber? Why would you do that? Why don't I put a nice slice of lemon in it or something? A cucumber? Are you in, what's wrong with you? Why would you want water? Yes. Do you have tips on how to write your stories? I do have tips on how to write your stories. Yes, my tips would be. It's a good, great question to end on. My tips would be always have more than one idea. That way, if someone turns down the first idea, you can say, ah ha ha, but I have another. Yeah, <laughs> which is good. Always consider what people say, but don't necessarily believe them. If they say, this is rubbish, you say, well, can you explain why? And if they give you reasons, you think, oh, maybe I can work on that. Maybe I can change that bit. But I think, actually, that this bit is all right. And if you believe that, that's fine, because you can't please everybody all the time. And the other thing I would just say is that just write lots. The more you write now, the better you'll be later on. It's like you wouldn't expect in a professional footballer just to be sort of like uh, picked for his team if they never kicked a ball around the playground. So the stuff we do when we're smaller is massively important to, uh, to everything we do later on. Reading and writing, whatever career you do, developing your imagination, whatever career you do, your life will be enhanced with those skills. So take the time just to uh, yeah, think about some of the things I said. Think about making up short, rude poems. They can be good fun. Uh, and if you want to write about favourite characters like I did, well, do it, because who knows where that might lead. Um, I very much enjoyed talking to you today. I tell you what, if you give me a round of applause, I'll shut up and we'll all go on with Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Cole! Thank you very much! That's very kind, thank you.